Raymond has one of the most fascinating bios on the internet. Uh, if you type uh, his name and what he's working on, I, he, his bio is so interesting that I had to stop what I was doing when I read it and called my wife and said, sweetie, check this out. So Raymond is an engineer, software engineer, entrepreneur, research scientist with a passion for improving internet experiences. He's contributed to distributed systems and security, including data privacy and blockchains. Uh, he co-founded Oasis Labs and created a networking project adopted by Google. His work's been recognized uh, globally in publications like Forbes and Wired and on platforms like NBC. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington and degrees in physics, electrical engineering, and computer science from MIT. His projects are used by millions, reflecting his impact on the tech industry. He also does break dancing and many other things, as far as I can recall, or rap, I think he's a rapper, Raymond, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, super stoked to have you, Raymond. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic to you and move the slides forward for you as we go. My name is Raymond. And today I want to talk to you about Open Source Observer, which is a tool that we've been building for measuring open source uh, software, particularly, and any of the software ecosystem around open source, which today really is all software. The way that we think about it is that every single software ecosystem is a financial problem. And open source is part of that ecosystem. And it's something that is underinvested today. And one of the things that we want to think about is how can we better place investments into open source software to maximize the ROI of that investment. And ROI in this case, obviously does not necessarily come in the form of financial return because open source software is meant to be freely shared and freely distributed around the world. It's really about maximizing the impact that we have on society. And society leverages already open source software in such incredible ways. Recent studies have shown that over 90% of companies use open source in some way. Over 76% of lines of code that ship to production, whether you're a small startup or a large company in Fortune 500, a pretty large majority of software that ships to production today is actually open source software. And we want to be able to provide data solutions that help allocators when they invest in open source software maximize that impact. And one way to think about it is like Moneyball for open source software. If you've seen the movie, basically we want to take a data-driven approach to change the way that we allocate money to open source today, where, you know, historically the way that we've funded open source has been a lot more discretionary, a lot more ad hoc, and typically lacking a systemic level, broader picture view of how do we how we're making impact. So we're helping these internet economies measure the impact of open source software. One of the directions that we're currently focusing on right now is crypto networks. One of the reasons why we're focusing on crypto networks today is because we know that they're investing a lot of money into open source software. There's on the order of a hundred million dollars a year that's currently being distributed to different open source projects in that ecosystem. At the top of the funnel, or in terms of inputs into the economy, that's incredible. It's generating a lot of developer activity. And one of the things that's really interesting about crypto networks is that all the user analytics for applications are typically also open source. So we can measure the impact all the way out to the number of users that it's touching, predominantly because any of the products that are built in the crypto space are built on top of the blockchain, which means we can analyze that in the open alongside any of our other data sources. But of course, our ambitions are much greater than that. These types of methodologies of how we think about ROI and how we think about funding allocation should be able to be applied to other forms of public public goods around the internet, including in traditional Web2 companies or any other company that's leveraging open source. But this is where we're starting because the data is so available. And this tends to be, at least in the crypto space, what most funding allocators are maximizing for. On one dimension, they want to see the number of users go up. On the other dimension, the number of developers and the health of the ecosystem in terms of active contribution also go up. So everybody's trying to go up and to the right here. That's not, again, not too different from many other ecosystems that exist. Think about machine learning, think about data science, think about, yeah, any kind of emerging tech. We typically want to be growing that ecosystem, improving productivity and developer velocity for those users, or for those developers, trying to retain high quality developers in that ecosystem, but more importantly, helping those developers with open source software build, be more productive and build better software, better products for users to basically grow that economy. Not that different than any other ecosystem. Just in crypto, it tends to be a different set of libraries that, that they focus on. It's an opportunity partly because we know that there's 
so much money that is about to be deployed in crypto networks. So we estimate that there's about $30 billion that's going to go into crypto ecosystems over the next several decades. These are sitting in ecosystem treasuries. And as I mentioned earlier, there's on the order of about $100 million a year that's currently going out predominantly towards for software. So how do you, how do we best um, allocate that money to drive growth in the smartest way is critically important for making sure that the ecosystem succeeds. Our most recent partnership was with a company, uh, or sorry, with an ecosystem called Optimism. They did what they call the retro PGF round, which basically means that they are trying to fund the most impactful project to their ecosystem with 30 million OP tokens that at that time was over a hundred million dollars. They had over 500 projects that were involved in this round, over a hundred voters and their decentralized governance mechanism that they were using to basically collectively try to decide what was the highest impact to these projects and which projects were highest impact to the ecosystem. And through that work, we were basically measuring all sorts of different things, including how the, how through that funding, we we're growing the pool of full-time developers and how more developers can now sustain themselves based on this funding. We're also measuring things like how integral are they to the open source community? How deeply rooted are they in the dependency tree? How many projects are depending on them? How beloved are they by developers? As well as going all the way downstream. What we care about is not just how much money is going in, but also how much, how many developers are being incentivized by this work. What kind of, where these developers are producing software in the software supply chain. And then ultimately how many users does this software ultimately cut on the bottom? That's what this Vector 7 is trying to trying to illuminate, which is how much activity are actually are we actually driving in the products and services that are built on top of this network? And how do we understand each one of these layers to, to drive higher conversion and higher return on that funding? This is just an early exploration. We're now starting to basically expand and go further in depth in this exploration with particularly on-chain activity. We want to be able to understand Typical product health related questions, for example, which are the highest quality users? What's the LTV of any particular user or a lifetime value? How much does it cost to acquire one of these users into the network? And which developers are bringing the highest value to the network and the highest, uh, the highest value users to the network? This is all of what we're doing. I should mention, I don't have a slide for this, but all of this is open source. And we've committed to building everything in open source observer to be Open source, open data, open infrastructure. That's one of the things that's quite different compared to other business intelligence or data science kind of tooling. We want to do this entirely with an, with an open community. All of our data pipelines are in our open source repository. We accept contributions from all over and we're excited to basically evolve this data pipeline with the community to better create metrics and analytics and insights that help drive better decisions. There are all sorts of ways to both contribute, get involved, but also consume the data. I welcome you to check out our documentation page. There are ways for folks to connect indexing infrastructure to contribute regular data streams to the data set. There's ways to propose impact models or data models in our data pipeline to help transform that data to a way that's most useful. There's different ways to share your insight if you're learning new things based on this data to drive better decision making. And we also have regular data challenges for folks who want to just dabble their feet and potentially be eligible for some prizes and in, in some of their contributions. So we have an API, but we also have public data sets in Google BigQuery right now. And we're looking to expand the ways that different people can leverage this data in different ways. We're most excited about how do we improve the state of funding towards open, towards open source software and public goods in general. So I, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to Check out our Telegram community, follow us on GitHub, or check out our documentation. Thank you.